Hi, um, I'm Joel. Nice to meet you. How's it going? Has the conference been, been good for you? Have you been enjoying yourself? I have. I really had a good time. So, yeah, the name of my talk is Working Functionally with Sweep Optionals. And this is the first slide. And that, don't need it anymore. This is the second first slide. So, yeah, I'm just going to sit down because otherwise it's awkward to use the keyboard. Yeah, so um, one of the most, like, different features of Swift, of Swift compared to Objective-C was definitely optionals, right? Now we are just going around placing question marks in our code, like string? What's a string? Well, optionals are actually very cool, right? They make you deal with the fact that something can be nil. Deal, deal with the fact like um, you might not have a value there, and if there's not a value like in Objective-C, your app might have crashed. With Swift, you have to check for that. So one of the way to check for that is with if let. So here we have, you know, like an input, an optional input, and an output. And if there's a value, we want to go into this branch with the if let. Otherwise, we want to go in the other one. So this is going to make it a bit bigger because I think I can do better than that. Why, why is there two screens? <laughs> oh. um, so yeah, I'm just going to make it bigger, sorry. Twenty two is not enough. Cool. Yeah. So you see like uh, input as a value, and so we go into the branch with the piglet. But if we remove the value, we go in the uh, oh. gosh, it never happened. It's just the very first time. Well, believe me, it's gonna go in the other, in the other bit. Let's try to print it. <clears throat> you know that if the playground has crashed, I need to restart. Yeah, everything. Cool. Well, we'll do that. Let's blame it on Xcode, right? Well, anyway, optionals are cool, and they crash your playground, but they don't crash, they don't crash your app. They help. There it is. So let's try it again. There's a sad face here because the playground crashed. Right, so um, this is if left. It's pretty cool. It makes you deal with the fact that like, there, there could be an optional, like a non-value in your code. But like, despite them being cool, they can be nasty. Here we have this kind of like, you know, advanced function that, given a user in your system, in your app, is going to give you back a fancy emoji for that. So you have this user from database function that returns an optional user because you might not have a user in your database. Then we have this function join name that given a user is going to return you a string with this join name doing magic string interpolation. Then we have this other function that given a string is going to give you back an emoji. And yeah, emoji is a type because I made it. And the emoji is going to be optional because, you know, like maybe not all the strings can become an emoji. And finally, we have fancy, fancy fi emoji, which even an emoji is going to give you a fancier emoji. So if we run it and if it doesn't crash, yeah, we, we're getting a panda here, right? And this is, this is cool, but as you can see, there's already two E flats, and the code is like trailing towards the right. It's it is readable because every function, the, the orange one up there, they give the meaning of what they're doing. But there's a lot of stuff over here. And well, hopefully we can do better with, than, than this. And this is what this talk is about. And about how functional programming can help us with sweep optionals. So functional programming. When I started to, you know, look into functional programming, I was, oh gosh, this is what they use in the academia world. And it's full of these weird terms like monad, applicative functor, and tail recursion, and I don't really need it for my apps. Like, they just use it in multi-core parallel application. Um, well, that's not really true. And if you think about it, the very, very core of functional programming is just hidden in plain sight, and it's functions. 
it's all about functions. So here, you know, like we have a simple uh, Swift function plus one that given a number it adds plus, plus three. And we can use it and we get 42, which is exactly 31 plus one. We can do, we can do surprisingly, right? We can do better than this. Well, better, we can do something even cooler, which is we can treat functions as first class citizen. So the same way that you can, you know, have a variable with an object inside, we can have a variable with a function inside. So let's create this uh, plus two function variable that takes an integer and return another integer. And that is equal to, you know, at the end. There you go. And we can use it exactly in the same, same way. So we could do like, I don't know, 22 gt is equal plus 2, 20, 22. And again, this is a function, but we are, we, we are storing it into a variable. And this is pretty cool because we can pass it around. So what we can do in functional programming languages and in Swift is to have functions that take other function as their input. So here we have this twice sum with a function that takes a function and the number and execute the function on the number and sums the result. So let's try it out. Uh, we can do, you know, let p equal twice sum a number, two, and function, I don't know, minus, well, maybe let's do plus, plus one. And the result is six. And it's like, yeah, two plus one, plus two plus one, and six. Um, this seems quite silly, but it's actually pretty useful, and we'll see it in, in a bit. The same way we can get functions as input, we can also have functions as output. And this is even weirder. So here we have this multiplier function that takes a m integer and returns a function from integer to integer. So we can use it to create another function that could be, I don't know, times three, which is multiplier three. And then who can guess what times three, three does? Nine, yeah, pretty cool. We can go even like, a, more meta if you want and do, um, sorry, multiplier three, four. Just, you know, like call it like this. So three, four, you know, I think it's, it's interesting at least. Well, function as input, function as output brings us to our first uh, functional programming concept, which is higher order functions. The first time that I heard of this term, I was like, oh my gosh, I, what is that? is simply, you know, a function that gets another function inside down. So um, I'm going to introduce you now to a very famous higher order function that has been mentioned already in other talks over here. Mm -hmm. And that's called map. Um, well, James, just a couple of hours ago, showed us what map does, but I know, let's just go through that again. So, oops, it is. Say that you have an array and you have a function. Um, so you see this dollar zero. So this is just a fancy way the Swift gives us to um, define inline functions in a closure kind of style. So this dollar zero means just the first argument that is passed to the function. And this double function simply multiplies by two. Okay, as you can see, I have a lot of fantasy in the examples that I've put in the code. So say that you have this array of integers and you have a function that multiplies sine two and you want you know, to apply the function to each element of the array and put it into another array. You could have this for loop that iterates on the array and executes the function double, or you, can, or you could just use map. So you can do map, sorry, array. So doubles equal array map function double. And the result? It's two, four, six, which is exactly what this one did before. Let's just, you know, print it just to be sure of our math. Oh, 
it's, it's, it's down here. And it's up there now. Here. All right? Well, you, you knew that already anyway. Right, so this is map. And, and it's pretty cool because we can avoid, like we, we've just jumped from three lines of code to simply one. We don't care about the four or like how to, you know, write a for loop. I always forget how to write it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, not kidding. Um, we just do a dot map. And in my opinion, it also reads better. Array, map, double. Double all the stuff in the array. Right. Um, turns out that array is a type. Um, this, you know, to some people might seem not intuitive, but array is actually a type. And you can give it another type that is going to store inside itself. So this array, you know, string, you're kind of telling the compiler that that array can only have strings element inside it. And here we have this fancy function, magic number, that does some math on the array, on, on a string, sorry. And we can map magic number on the array. And yeah, is that already. That is the magicification of the strings in the array. And, well, we've been talking about arrays all this time, but the talk is actually about optional. So let's look at the optionals. Optional is a type as well. So that question mark that we, that we did, like, um, you know, before, string, um, is actually the same thing as writing, you know, optional, an optional type that is containing a string. And if we compare this definition here, optional string, with what we had before, array string, they're quite similar. Turns out they're very similar. In fact, optional has its own definition of map as well. And this might not be as intuitive as it is for array. So here we have a time stand function, right? That multiplies by 10. And we have an optional with 42 inside. This is the same thing as writing, I don't know, that I int 42, just in a longer way. And we map the timestamp function on this optional value, and we get 420. If the optional was empty, was none, didn't have any value, was nil, we will get nil. So basically what map does in the context of an optional is that it applies the function to the value inside the optional, if the optional has a value. Otherwise, it simply returns um, non-optional. Let's follow the types. What does it mean? So here we have, you know, our, our friendly magic number function again. Uh, it changed, if you notice. Optional, uh, an optional string and an optional array. And then we, you know, map magic number on these two variables. So in the case of the optional string, we have this, you know, optional string, then this is just, you know, to give some space, then we have a function, magic number, that goes from string to an integer, and the result is, you know, I'm going to print it for you. An optional with an integer inside. So what we have here, the type of that x is optional int, right? And if we do the same, you know, follow the type thing for the array, we have an array with strings inside, a function is the same string to integer, and what we get back is an array of integers, right? So these two definitions look pretty similar, don't they? The only thing that is different is that up here we have optional, and instead in the row below we have array. So again, 
optional and array kind of they kind of they look similar, and and they are similar because they both um, are instances of what is called a functor, and this is like our second functional programming concept, a functor. People you know use very weird metaphors for functors, and um, it doesn't matter the practical definition of a functor is a type on which you can define map, and that's it. There's more about it, more mathematical stuff, uh, which I don't know, so I'm not gonna try to explain. Um, cool, so let's see if we can have a less nasty if lab. We've seen that with map, we can get like an optional of a generic type, a function that takes that generic type and returns something else, and map them together instead of using if lab. And that's exactly what's going on up here with optional user and user string. And here, uh, optional emoji and emoji emoji. So let's try to write it again. Um, so we start with user from database map. The function is called join name. And then we want to use it, the result, into optional, no, sorry, emoji from string. So you need to, you know, we have to actually use another if flat. I'm going to put a J. Then we do, we can do, you know, emoji from string and the string is the J above because it's not an optional. Then we can map this fancy file. And since, since that's it, we can just return it. Boom. Our code is, is quite smaller right now, right? And I think, again, it's a bit more readable. User from database, join name, emoji from string, intensify emoji. But we're not there yet. What I would really like, now that I know that I can, you know, chain map together, would be to have like a complete chain of maps and just avoid that return and avoid the, the flat. But we can't really do that yet. And this is the second part of the talk. It gets a bit fancier. So since apparently it's a thing over here to have anvils dropping from <laughs> the sky, I just, I just put, put it in there to just have a little bit of a break. Right. Uh, hopefully it's not going to crash our playground again. <laughs> um, I have to say this is Xcode beta, right? So it's expected. So what we would do... What we would like to do is to just return. So user on database, map, join name, then we, you know, let's try map again, um, emoji from string, and then we map again uh, the fancify emoji. Um, but that's not, ah, you see, the, the, Auto-completion added a question mark there. I didn't want it. I just wanted to show you that it's not compiling. And the error we get is, see that error, is that the, basically the parameter that we're passing through that map function is unexpected. The reason is if we look back at the type that I deleted, is that this function here emoji from string that is defined here returns an optional emoji. Which means that if we try to, instead of return it to print this, this one, we get printed as there's a return above. It doesn't compile. It's not compiling because, you know, he's expecting the function to return something and we're not returning, so. Right, there, you, there we are. So we have an optional optional because that function gets something and returns an emoji, optional emoji, but that something is an optional already and so we got, we got you get a nested optional, which doesn't really make sense, does it? We've introduced, like, map, this helper guy, 
through array. So let's go back to arrays. What do we do when we have nested arrays? If we try to, uh, this function here, duplicate, duplicate, it's quite silly. Gets a value and it, you know, just places it into an array twice. We can use map because we just learned how to use it on an array. And yeah, we're getting this. Let me print it for you. This array of arrays, which is kind of similar of an optional with an optional inside. What we would like to do is simply flatten it, you know, like, like putting it down on the iron. So we can just call this flatten method. method. And we get, you know, like, we get this flattened BD bi bidirectional collection with the array, array inside. It's very, it's very confusing, but if we look at it, it's just, um, oh. it's very confusing because we're not using my super nice custom function that I wrote, which is called flat, and we can use it on array map duplicate. And now we have a proper flattened array. Um, it should scroll. It's not scrolling because, you know, like demon gods. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have nested array. You just, you can flatten them. Swift provides you with this flatten function, which returns this weird type. If you don't like it, I've just defined this flat by myself. It's pretty silly. It just loops on the array twice and appends all the results. <laughs> this stuff here, uh, flat map, is actually something, ah, see, yeah, flatten, I already told you about it. Uh, um, this flat map is something that is already defined by Swift and by the functional programming uh, frameworks, languages, and it's exactly the same thing that we just did, right? So we have an array, we apply map on the function, and then we flatten it. Flat map does it automatically for us. Do you see here we have one, one, two, Let's see if printing this one makes it easier. Yeah, flattened array. This is what flat, flat map does. Gets an array of stuff, a function that works on that stuff and returns an array and instead of giving you back an array of arrays, it just flattens it, or, or actually flattens it, and, and you get back just a monodimensional array, and it's pretty cool. And we saw that arrays and optional are very similar. Optional and array both have map. Array has flat map. Are you guessing what's coming next? No? All right, well, I'll tell you. Optional has flat map as well. Here we have this function here, it's called half, and takes an integer and returns an optional integer because if it can't divide, divide the integer by two, it's just gonna return you none. And if we try to uh, map this half function on our optional, as we did before, right? We get a optional optional. But if instead of mapping it, we flat map it, uni, like just a flat optional, just optional 21, which is way better, and is gonna work with what we got next. But this is the third and last functional programming concept that we're gonna introduce in this talk, and it's called monad. So monad, a lot of people are talking about monads. Monads are like burritos. I like burritos, but I don't think they look like monads. A monad, the practical, the practical definition of mod, a monad for us Swift developer is a type on which you can define flat map and map. Easy peasy. So we can now attempt to write a better E flat using map and flat map. So we saw that the problem is that this guy here, joint username, mm, can I print it? Yep. 
screen. Username. Print it for me, please. Um, it's not printing it. What did I do wrong? Can somebody help me? Right. <laughs> Yeah, so the username is Bruce Wayne because, you know, I like Batman. Um, and uh, this guy is, yeah, it is, it is an optional Bruce Wayne, but we are, we are, we are not seeing it. Tr trust me on that. Um, actually, I think, I think we, can, we, can, we can try it. Can we? So, yeah, print, uh, join username. Join username is... True. You see, it is an optional string, optional Bruce Wayne. Okay, um, let's fix this if flat. So we have a map here, and we want to flat map this one because this is the one that was giving us trouble with the um, double option, double optional. Now we just map fancify emoji. There you go. I mean, can you agree with me that this is way nicer code? There's no E flat. There's no indentation towards the right. Well, there is a bit, but just because it wouldn't make sense to have it indented with return. And you can just read it through, and it's describing what the code does, not how it does it, which is something that I'm just stolen from the reactive Coco presentation before. So we got username. We join the name, we get an emoji from that name, and we fancified, and we get a pan panda back. <laughs> and that's, that's about it, right? And if I was able to explain it to you, it means that it's not rocket science, right? So this is, this is just like a silly example, right? Who, who goes around adding stars to pandas. Let's, let's see if there's, you know, like some if I was able to come up with better examples for that. Okay, so say that we have a um, um, calendar app. We have this struct, which is an event, and then we have this other struct, which is a calendar that does a lot of thing, things, among which as a function, today events, that returns an are optional array of events. Of course, like here, I had to implement something, so it's returning something for real but it could return nothing because maybe you don't have anything scheduled for today. And for some reason I decided that nothing was better than an empty array. Then we have this renderer struct, struct which has a render method that given an event prints it to our console. And then a render events that takes an array of events and use map to render them. So get array and apply to each element of the array the function render. We finally have, you know, at the higher level of our code, an instance of renderer and an instance of calendar. And we want to render all of today's event. Let's see if I'm able to do it. So we saw the calendar as a function today event. That isn't an optional. So we can start from that. So calendar to the events, which returns an optional array of events. And then we know that um, this renderer guy here is, can accept, you know, as a function that takes a, an array of events as input. So I'm just gonna write it up here. There's something that gives us an event optional. Then we have a function that takes an event and doesn't return anything, but like we don't care about it. So we can use map. Render, um, render events. And here's my events for the day. Breakfast, lunch, afternoon tea, and then the talk, which is now. And 
again, like we could argue onto this, but this code is quite readable, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Calendar to the event, and then render renders render those events. And it's pretty simple. There's no like new lines, no indentation, no for loops. I think this is good. Let's go on to another event uh, example. So this is Santa's workshop manager version 2.0. Santa in the North Pole has given like all his elves employee their iPads. And what he's gonna do is so send there's so you have a struct child with a bool, naughty or not. We have a struct present and we have a present order struct and a present order is like um, you know all the steps that an elf has to do to assemble the present for the child, for the children. Um, we have a function that given a child gives back an optional present because if the child is not is naughty, it's not gonna give you it's not gonna give him a present, right? And then we have this other function here that given a present generates the present order. Like it's gonna go into the North Pole database and look up all the information, the um, warehouse with the stock of presents and stuff. We have our children's, one is naughty and the other one isn't. And we want to get an array of all the presents order for the children. And the way we could do it is with a lot of for loops and implets, or we could just do get the children, then we could map. Uh, I actually forgot how to do this, so I have actually really to think it. So we have all the children, and we have a function that given a uh, child gives us a present, so we can map this one. And for child, I'm not gonna work like that, so we can do this. Present for child, dollar zero. This one here, so we have children's, which is an array, so we have an ar back an array of optional presents. We have this function here that given a present, returns a present order, so we can simply um, map it, uh, order for present. There you go, and I should print it, I suppose. Like presents. Right, and we have um, optional present order and nil because that ch child was naughty and it doesn't deserve a present. <laughs> and that's that's kind of that's kind of it. Um, I think programming with optionals and functional programming is pretty cool. It certainly makes me type less. And the code that I'm writing, once you get past like what is a map, what is map, what is flat map, and the weird dollar zeros, is it's quite readable. And again, I really like the idea that I can look at a code, and the only thing that it, that I get is the description of the steps that are going through. Not like um, assigning this on a temp variable, iterating on the array, putting on the results, and, and and stuff. Um, I really like it, and I think you should try it out in your applications as well. Does anybody have any question? Does anybody have any question? <laughs> yeah. 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 So. A fu just a functor, yeah. um, not that I know of. They kind of go ends to ends. Um, the difference between monad and functor is that um, functor is a subset of monad, and there are laws that a type has to um, comply to to be a functor and or a monad uh, and a monad and. I'm not really able to explain those laws to you at the moment, 
because I can't like I kind of understood them, but kind of not so so so. And the practical definition is it's quite cool and is everything you need to write code. Those laws are useful if you were actually going to um, you know, build your own type, your own functor or monad type, and verify that is actually, uh, like that is compliant to the definition of monad and functor. Other examples of, of monads and functors are uh, result. I don't know if any of you guys have looked at, you know, a bit more functionally programming things with Swift, but like there's this result type. This is like an, it's like an optional under steroids because it represents like an operation that can result into something. And if the operation fails, instead of getting like a none, like optional does, you can get an error. So you get that extra context of what went wrong. Um, yeah, that is like the super monad. Other uh, functional programming language like Haskell, they have the IO monad, so they basically have removed all the input output to, I don't know, the, the terminal into this monad, and they just map and flat map and apply, which is another thing that you can use to um, avoid having side effects in your code. And that's pretty neat, but I don't know Haskell, so I can't show it to you. Yeah. So, sorry guys, I forgot how to type. Um, so this one, yeah, this one is, there's actually a, a full podcast with a discussion about this, the like a behavior of flat map, uh, because this special one where you get an optional, a function that is expecting, that is returning an optional, but you get back an array of non-optionals is not in line with the definition of flat map from the uh, Monadi clause. This is a special one that Swift does, but like, I mean, it's cool. Because, yeah, it's so useful. Because I was, when I was working on this example, I was like, I was like, gosh, I'm getting back this, you know, weird, weird array of stuff, which is like half wrapped, uh, like, a, optional and, and nils, and it is not very nice. But like if you use flat map in this way, in this like unconventional way, it's better. Or let's say that it gets to the point quicker. Yay. Um, do you guys have any other question? I have no idea how long I've been talking for. Probably more than I was supposed to. Yep. I'm going to leave you with this last slide, which is the next level of weirdness, which is operators. <laughs> Thanks a lot.